Welcome to Engaging Leaders, a Leadership Maryland podcast brought to you by Beacon at Salisbury University and BFG Financial Advisors. Since 1992, Leadership Maryland has been connecting and empowering leaders through transformational experiences, dialogue, and education. Each month, we host candid conversations to promote positive outcomes in your organizations and communities. I'm your host, Eric Brotman, and our guest today is Freeman Hrabowski, uh, who needs no introduction in Maryland and, frankly, almost worldwide. Uh, but, uh, but Dr. Hrabowski, I'm going to do my best to introduce you with an abbreviated version of your bio today. Uh, Dr. Hrabowski served as president of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, since 1992. He was named as one of America's best leaders by U.S. News & World Report in 2008. Um, and U.S. News & World Report also ranked UMBC the nation's number one up-and-coming university six straight years uh, through from t- 2009 to 2014. And for the past five years, UMBC has been in the top 10 on a list of the nation's most innovative national universities. Time Magazine has named Dr. Hrabowski one of America's 10 best college presidents in 2009 and one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2012. And most recently, he received the American Council on Education's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Uh, Dr. Hrabowski, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Eric. And please call me Freeman. My pleasure. So, Freeman, the backdrop of our conversation today really circles around not only leadership, but specifically leadership in times of turmoil, which we're certainly experiencing as a country and as a world on so many different levels. Uh, And I also want to make sure we talk a little bit about innovation and certainly about the role that higher education plays. So um, with that sort of nine headed hydra of an open, uh, I'm going to let you start, I I think, in in general terms about leadership and particularly leadership in times like we're facing today. Sure. I'm going to tell you what I say to my students and to colleagues and what people say to me in tough times. It is so important that we remember the light is shining on our character. Uh, for us as a country, as universities, as as individuals, that you really see what people are made of when times are difficult. It's it's easy to live life when things are going really well. But life is like this. There are difficult moments, and it's in those moments of difficulty that each of us shows who we are. And leaders especially are, are called on on to to talk about the values that are most important. And so for me, when I think about leadership, the first thought I have is something I say in the new book that my colleagues and I have written on the Empowered University, and that is that it's not about me. It's about us. That's the first sentence in the book. It's not about me. It's about us. Leadership should be about empowering people, not about having the light shining on us, but through our actions, we should be demonstrating the values we consider most important. And for for enlightened leaders, those values will focus on the notion of supporting each other, of bringing out the best in each of us, of being able to keep hope alive, even when times seem very difficult, and using our analytical skills to dissect the problems and to think through how best to, to carve out pieces that we can work on first. You know, I, I do want to give Renee and Leadership Maryland a shout out because as a member of that first class with people like Jim Brady and and the, and our beloved, the late Catherine Gira, what we learned about ourselves and this state was that it was important to open our minds and to be willing to listen to different perspectives. Those of us from the Baltimore, Washington corridor saw the eastern shore or western Maryland one way, and in many ways we didn't have it right. We clearly didn't have it right. We needed to listen to our friends and colleagues from that part of the state and and vice versa. And that's the case now in our country, that leadership means helping people to see the other person's perspective. And most important, to try to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And then finally, I would say this, the notion of keeping a positive attitude as a leader is more important now than ever. If we only talk about, oh, woe is us, and it's so bad then we are not telling the whole picture because what we know from humankind, the history of humankind is we fall down, but we get up. We have difficulty, but we move out of it. Whether we're talking about the market or talking about periods of war, things that are bad can happen, but we find a way to move to the next level. And, and for us at the university at UMBC and for people in this country, we believe in our campus. We believe in my students and in our, in our colleagues, our, our alumni, 
but we also believe in our country. And we have had difficult periods before, and I've been through them myself, and we will get through it. Whether we're talking about the, the COVID pandemic or the civil unrest and the fact that there is structural racism in our country, we are facing it in a way that makes me so proud of America to tell the truth and about what's what's going on right now and to say, what can we do to make a difference? Let me stop there, Eric, because I could go on and on, but I, I need you to ask me questions to help me specify <laughs> the areas where you want me to focus, okay? Freeman, that's great. And I, and I could listen to you all day. So, you know, a 25 to 30 minute show could be four hours and I'd be perfectly comfortable with that. Um, <laughs> it, it, so let's talk about all of those various topics can be unpacked and, and there's a lot yes. of information there and a lot of, a, a lot of emotion too. Let's start with COVID because um, yes. we're recording this show in advance of its release. So there'll be new information today, much less, you know, in the next three days. So sort of in a, a sure. big picture from 50,000 feet, sure. Sure. COVID has done a couple of things. One, it has definitely separated the haves from the have nots in a profound way. There are people yes. whose lives have bar- barely been impacted and others who are who are suffering immeasurably. And in yes. higher education, in higher education, it's also created an interesting challenge uh, as a university president, as any college, not only to attract students, but to figure out how do you how do you do this? Do you can you open the campus? Sure. Is it safe? Is sure. it so? Sure. So let's sort of unpack both of those ideas first as it relates to COVID. So, so let me start by saying that, that we're very fortunate that we are part of a university system of Maryland and we are focused on best practices. We're, we're very fortunate to have a, a physician who is the head of our system, Jay Perman, uh, and we are all relying heavily on UMB, the medical school, and Bruce Jarrett. So we, we all of the campus presidents in the university system of Maryland are meeting two to three times per week, um, obviously through Zoom or regular phone calls to talk about how we're gonna be handling the fall And the two or three things I can say about our campus that are very exciting, more families than ever want to come to UMBC. Our applications are up, our registrations are up, and they're wanting to know what's the fall going to look like. Well, we're being very conservative in the approach. We're bringing some students back, but many many of our classes and many of the students will will continue to be online. And the reason for that is that we want to be as cautious as possible when thinking about health and safety of our students, number one. And number two, we want to make sure we're building community among those students. And you can build community not just in person, but through technology. We are one of the leading campuses in the country in the use of technology. A third of our a third of the IT graduates in the state of Maryland come from UMBC. So we've got a lot of expertise that we can use to build community and to strengthen teaching and learning. And what we're saying to people is We need to have the time to see what happens with this disease in our country with our policies. And so we want to give ourselves a time, not because the college students are as much at risk, even though they can get the disease. But we see that the fatality rate for them is much lower than for those of us who are over 55 or 60. And so we're thinking through that that approach. So, for example, in our residence halls, we'll have only one person per room um, uh, and between 40 and 50 percent of our undergrads live on campus but we're gonna have maybe half that number just because we're trying to have as much social distancing as possible and most important uh, we are making sure that we're only charging students for the services that they're getting so a number of the parking if they're not on campus they shouldn't have to pay parking fees so we're working with them but to, to answer another part of your question uh, there are students who are really with difficulties who did not have Wi-Fi access, did not have computers. We have worked with those students to give them loaners and to work with them to have places where they can do the work. And so we are being as responsive. And I think for every campus, regardless of what percent of students you're bringing back, what you'll see is that we're all working to be as responsive to our families as possible. So in terms of the, the population at UMBC, I, I have heard you yes. speak a number of times about students who have faced incredible hardships economically and otherwise. Uh, in fact, sure. even I think some, some homeless students, and I, I know that's an, sure. an interesting, extremely difficult thing, particularly sure. Uh, sure. This, this spring. Um, sure. The use of the use of technology is part of that. Um, how are you making sure that that you're able to foster that sense of community, even if some of it is is in fact remote? I, I consider that to be a very challenging, not insurmountable, but very challenging thing, especially for sure. those who maybe need community the most. Sure. We have. You remember, we have fourteen thousand students, of whom eleven thousand undergrads. But but even this past semester, while classes were online, we had 
hundreds of students on campus because they either did not have somewhere to go um, uh, a home conducive for the work or they were from another country. 60% of our students have at least one parent who comes from another country. So we are both talking about about diversity we are from all over the world and so some of those students could not get back to their countries for example uh, and yet most are Maryland residents but they have a parent from another country that's the Baltimore Washington card as you know but and so we've got that range of students whether they're talking about the economy or talking about geography and so we have worked to be with some specificity in how we meet the needs of each of those students even as we have been working to find ways of giving more financial assistance to student, to middle class people who've lost their jobs. So we're doing all we can to support those students. I mean, that's that's the name of the game. And, uh, you know, some people are thinking, well, um, online instruction can never be as good as face to face. Well, we people know half of our students are in science, the other half in arts, humanities and social sciences. And anyone who's seen my TED talk sees me talking about the fact that as a country, we have done. Uh, an abysmal job in keeping students in science and engineering. Only 5% of our graduates are in science and engineering. In Europe, it's about 11%. And we talk about weed out courses. Well, those are weed out courses from face-to-face -face instruction. So I'm saying a part of innovation is accepting the idea that everything we've done in face-to-face -face has not necessarily been the best way anyway. That innovation means believing that tomorrow can be better than today and that we want to do things differently. And using technology can help us with that. And we, we have hundreds of faculty who are working on uh, strengthening the approaches that we use in online instruction. For the summer, they're doing that, preparing for the fall. And summer, in, summer enrollment online is up more than ever right now. So we are getting better and better at it. And what the future will hold, by the way, is some hybrid approach. There, there are wonderful courses in person, of course. There's nothing wrong with in-person, but if you get accustomed to using Skyping or whatever, you can see that you can have that interaction, that face-to-face. -face. You get to understand the expressions. You can see your students. And, they, and so we need people of a certain age, particularly some of us who are older, to not just assume things are better when um, it's face-to-face. -face. There can be some combination that can be even more effective than simply face-to-face. -face. Now, uh, I've been amazed to hear some of my best our best humanities professors saying to me, Freeman, we've had a kind of intimacy through technology in some of our courses than ever before. And so we need to keep it open mind. This show is about innovation. And I'm saying, as Leadership Maryland is about innovation and how we can be better as a state, I would say we have to learn not to, not to just accept the idea that the good old days were the best way. Uh, two thirds of students right now in face-to-face -face science are weeded out in America. So we have to do things differently anyway. You, you, you talk about the good old days, and there are some people who would say the good old days were great, and some who would say they weren't so great. So let's pivot a little bit. Uh, you, you were born in 1950 in Birmingham, Alabama, in a world that I would love to think was dramatically different than the world is today, some 70 years later, uh, but in some ways maybe isn't so different. So can, can we talk about um, not only the civil rights movement from the 60s, but how, how these things are manifesting themselves now and how the, the national and, in fact, worldwide attention is, is moving this conversation. Um, I, I, there's so much to unpack there and so many things I want to ask you, but let's start with sort of the broad um, basis for this. I, I mean, are, are we repeating history? Are we improving on uh, something that we did before? Is the, messaging, is the messaging resonating or is it getting lost in some of the shouting back and forth? Like, what is, what is the, right. uh, what's your take on, on where we are? I appreciate that. You know, most important, your question speaks to the need to uh, to focus on the education of our citizens, because a part of education is an understanding of history and those periods in our past, whether the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, as it was called then, or the 1960s, uh, when we had civil unrest, I was a child leader under Dr. King, went to jail and spent a week in protest in jail, a horrible experience, but an empowering experience because it, as my high school principal said, it taught me about the role and the notion of civil disobedience, that when there is something that's unjust, we as citizens have the right to protest. I've been very encouraged by the protest. There are ways in which this country is better today 
than it was in, in the 60s. And anybody who was alive in the 60s would have to know that. I could not have been president of a predominantly white university in the 60s. In fact, UMBC was the first university in the state of Maryland founded at such a time, 1966, that people of all races could go there. Every other institution, public and private, was either for blacks or for whites. You know, my name, Rabowski, is Polish, but I am African-American. And the fact is that um, the country has made progress. But in making that progress, we've been able to shine light on where we've not made progress. It's only been 100 years since women could vote. And yet we still have issues with the incomes and salaries of women. We think about African-Americans. And the fact is we've got a disproportionate number in the criminal justice system. And the most prestigious of scholars from the National Academies of Sciences has said that the number one reason is structural racism. This is not about emotion. This is about the power of the intellect to look at the situation and analyze it. So whether talking about criminal justice or talking about uh, police brutality or talking about the academic achievement gap or talking about health disparities, we see that people of color and particularly African-Americans and Latinx people are doing poorly in our country. Those of us who are well educated are obviously doing much better. But even those would talk about some of the problems. But to me, what it says is what's different about today from the 60s is that while there were uh, some whites who were very courageous and, and rode buses down to the South to be supportive, most people were either afraid or not comfortable getting involved. Today, we see we see people all over the world and in this country of all races saying we can be better than this. We are better than this. And that's the part that we should all be encouraged by. And the vast majority of these protests are very peaceful. We've heard about people who've been paid to come in and, and bring the violence. But for the most part, people have been very peaceful about these things. And and what what sa- what that says to me is that Americans want to see a better society, one in which we are fair, that we live up to the ideals of what it means to be an American. And and that encourages me. I when my students ask me, Doc, why do you seem why do you seem so hopeful? I said, because I've seen a different world. I'm seeing a different world now. We are saying we can be better than this. And I have no doubt we will. Most people don't know that in nineteen sixty five, before the Higher Education Act, only ten percent of Americans had college had a college degree. Most white families, let alone black families, never thought their children would get a college degree. But it was that civil rights movement that led to people saying it's not fair that only wealthy people would get a college degree. We changed dramatically in the 60s and 70s, so much so that today 30 plus percent of Americans have a college degree. It's about 40 percent for whites. It's about 25 percent for for blacks. For Latinx, it's only about 15 percent, but we are making progress with two year degrees and four year degrees. And I am convinced that just as we've made progress before, we will make progress during this period. Uh, you, you know, I, I'm encouraged by your by your sense of optimism. I, sh- I share it, quite frankly. I don't know any other way to go through life other than optimistic and, and seeing that there will be some good that comes out of this sort of the, the sun shining after the darkness. Um, so I want to I want to ask you about two things um, because you brought them up and because they are um, because they play into sort of a leadership role. I think we have leaders and, and not to not to get political because I desperately don't want to. But we have we have leaders who are very busy shouting at each other and um, and social media. To me, social media is one of the things that's making this different from when Martin Luther King was reading was leading protests because the, the, the news can travel very quickly now, but it can also be misinformation and it can also be slanted in, in, in whatever way you choose. So mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about two things. One is the, the idea of understanding history because you said you yeah. have to understand history. Um, yes. Are, are, we, are we making a mistake by in some ways erasing history in the face of whether it's defaming, defacing statues or taking things down? Should these things be moved to a museum so we can at least preserve and understand the things that weren't beautiful about our history as opposed to making them disappear so you can't learn from them? Is that, I mean, am I, I can appreciate if, it, you know, if, if, if we take a, a group of folks, let's say we had a, a group of, uh, of Jewish students on your campus and there was a statue of Hitler on the campus, I would anticipate mm-hmm. that they would be very uncomfortable by that statue, even if it was, well, we're trying to understand our history and we don't like it either. So I, I, trying to put myself in a different position and seeing some of these Confederate, particularly Confederate militias or con, uh, Confederate groups, 
I'm certain that brings up some and turns up some very painful things that I don't personally understand, uh, except mm-hmm. esoterically. So are we making a mistake by by erasing them or defacing them or removing them as opposed to finding a way to isolate them to a place where you can go specifically to study history? We need, it's a great question. And I think we would all agree that we would never have that monster Hitler as a statue in our country because of what we know in the what I would almost call the immediate past. It was just back a few years ago, a few decades ago. Um, the, the, The critical point for me is this. We need much more education and many more difficult conversations about all these areas. Uh, we need to be able to understand why a black child who looks into the face of the Confederacy realizes that his forebears were treated like animals. It's hard for some people to understand what that means, but they were treated like animals. Uh, it is more painful than most people understand. And it's painful for whites to think that they may have had forebears who treated human beings like animals. So this is a very painful concept in our country. We need opportunities to talk about those things and to think through the best approach to not forgetting history, because lest we forget, we end up doing the same thing again. There's no doubt about that. Um, the, 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 for me, it is about having the difficult conversations and speaking the truth and thinking through ways of finding that common ground. And it's, it's uncomfortable, and it will require people to build trust. And right now is a time when we need trust. You know, I, I agree that we don't, we don't want to get political because right now people don't listen to different sides. I, I, I have no problem with that. And, and I, uh, as a college president, I have wonderful donors who are from both parties, who are wonderful people. Uh, most people I find in America, regardless of what part of the in are, somewhere in the middle, we all care about children, for example. We really do know education is important. We've got to look at those areas for the common ground, it seems to me, that's really important. But the other point is that when thinking about a democracy, I'm saying to people, yes, people have the right to protest. And then the question is, what comes after the protest? This is the issue we have to deal with. And one of the points we're making on our campus is we have to have people ready to vote. We don't want to tell people whom to vote for, but it is our, I would say it's an American right, but also an American responsibility to participate in that progress, in that process, and to vote for people whose values you respect and whose values would do the things you think are important. Uh, Whether it's about closing the achievement gap or about making sure people have healthcare, people have, we have the opportunity and we need to use democracy which is so messy, to have the conversations, to get beyond the emotions, and to do what makes sense for the public good, for people. Because we, we say as an ideal in our country that we want justice for all. These are what, this is what people of all races are protesting around the world, not just here. I'm, I'm studying French right now, and I'm reading in French about protests about blacks in Paris. Unbelievable. People all over the world. And they're not just talking about for blacks in this country. They're talking about things that happen in other countries for people of color. But but it is this wonderful concept that more and more Americans and human beings around the world are saying we can be better than this as a human society to make sure there is justice for all. That that has to be the highest ideal that we as leaders continue to talk about. And a part of that justice has to do with understanding our history and how we go about doing that. And so the questions you ask are those that must be topics in substantive, difficult conversations. So Leadership Maryland prides uh, itself and ourselves on facilitating those conversations, having conversations Mm -hmm. that do make people uncomfortable, but Mm -hmm. also that allow people not only to share their perspectives, but most importantly, to learn from other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. How how do we take that bubble, that 52 people who learn to to trust and respect one another, not to agree on everything, but but Mm -hmm. to respect one another enough to truly listen and truly try to understand as best we're all able? Um, yeah. How do you how do you take that to the broader world? It, it's mm-hmm. you know, we, we sort of operate that in a fishbowl and it works great. But then you have to then you have to leave the fishbowl when you when you leave the class that day. 
you know, it, it reminds me of a, a scene in Remember the Titans where, where the, the, the young people come together in a real painful way when they're at camp and then they get back to school and they realize, my goodness, nobody else sees it the way we do because they haven't had the experience we had. Sure, um, sure. How do we take well, that to I the larger that. world? Well, you know, I, I am so impressed by leadership, Marilyn, because you do have these leaders from all over the state with different perspectives, public and private sectors. And the two things that are most significant to me, number one, we build trust among people in that group. We come to understand that we can have different points of view. We may even have different political points of view, but we build a level of trust. When you build trust with people, uh, you can get so much done. You know, on our campus at UMBC, we often talk about the need to agree to disagree. We want our students to know we can agree to disagree and still continue to work together with civility. I think it's so important. And, and Leadership Maryland does that. I, I mentioned two people to begin with, and there's so many, so many friends and colleagues from Leadership Maryland. But I think about, again, our beloved Catherine Gere, uh, the late Catherine Gere. And then I think about uh, Jim Brady. Uh, and we were all there together in that first class at Leadership Maryland. And then we were leaders. And we w there were some things we did that we did together, whether it was at the University System of Maryland, all the way over to the Maryland Humanities Council. And the, the same approach you can see with members of Leadership Maryland from around the state, that they are involved in other groups and they can take what they learn from those other groups to help. I, I love seeing, I believe, that you've done things with, with Stevenson, for example, where my dear, dear friend Elliot Hirschman is the president. Uh, and we will see, you'll see people who've been in Leadership Maryland who are having an impact on these kinds of issues around our state in public, in the public and private sectors. And we can call on each other to get points of view. I get people calling me, Prima, what do you think? Because in this time, we're all looking for support for building community. What we work to do at UMBC and what every institution and organization I'm sure will be working to do uh, or has been working to do is to build support for each other. Uh, so much so that even when we have these differences, we can work through those differences. That's a part of the messiness of the American democracy. We don't have to always agree, but we should have a level of trust that we can, as I said, we can agree to disagree agreeably and and find the common <laughs> ground on all these areas. Uh, Freeman, we're, we're, we're getting really close to the end of our show. I wish we weren't because, frankly, I could talk to you all day. And it's funny that you mentioned Jim Brady. He is our guest next month. So we're, oh. we're going to have uh, – you guys are the best one-two punch I could fathom for, to, you know, to start a new, to start a new show. Uh, so, so, uh, so thank you for teeing him up. He'll be, he'll be pleased. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one last question um, before we close the show. And, yeah. um, you know, typically what, what we want to know is sort of what is the – what is the one uh, tip, the one idea, that, uh, that the one way that people, particularly in emerging leaders, um, but anyone can improve their leadership acumen, maybe build some influence? And if you don't mind being put on the spot, I would love to do that in the context of the conversation we've had where – you, you know, I, 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 particularly politically, where, where I think you're right that some 80%, and I'm making the statistic up, but some 80% are purple, not red or blue. You know, we're, we're, uh -huh. there's, yeah. a, there's yeah. a lot yeah. of, there's, but, but we tend to focus not on our consensus, but on our differences in ways that, right. while, that while that can create important dialogue, it also can create vitriol, particularly over social media. So uh, sure. how do you grow your leadership acumen? How do you grow your influence? Yeah. Sure. Uh, in, sure. in, in a condition where it's very hard to have your voice heard anywhere in the moderate centrist uh, uh, arena. Yes. You know, I start by, I, I work with new college presidents in the Harvard program and presidents from all over the world. And the first thing I will tell you is that people are people. We're human beings. And when people ask me, well, what's the most important thing about being a president? I'm saying, first of all, to know yourself, a sense, having a sense of self, of who you are of what you consider really important, really important. And number two, of taking care of yourself. And this is what I wanna to say to leaders. This is a stressful time for all of us. And it's so important that we focus on our emotional, psychological, physical, and spiritual health. Very important. And then the notion of being positive, of knowing we can get through this. It's so easy when you look at social media, when you look at, 
at, at the different TV shows to just go down, 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 down. More of this and more of this is bad, is bad. The economy, this and this. And, and sometimes I'm saying to people, move away from the technology some and hear the stories of people, the inspiring stories of people, because we all need inspiration. You know, um, I am, let me just give you a quick inspiring story about COVID. I've got two graduates who are scientists at NIH, two women, one black, one white, one from rural North Carolina, one from Frederick, Maryland. And they are leading major studies to save millions of lives. One is, has led the study that has, the, that has developed the vaccine that is the farthest along right now. It's actually uh, getting ready for phase three uh, at Moderna. Uh, right now for COVID, quite frankly. Uh, and it's just so exciting to see a young woman in her 30s who is the leader of that team, who has developed that vaccine. And the other is the young woman from, from Frederick, Maryland, uh, Caitlin Sadler, who has actually is leading the study to look at the asymptomatic patients. And the thought that I have is here are two of America's children, little girls who grow up to become scientists and who will save millions of lives with what they're doing. And and to me, all I can think is goosebumps <laughs> in the midst of yeah. all of that, that there is hope that you've got these two people from such back, different backgrounds uh, who are committed to using their brain power to solve problems that will save millions of lives. And I know we will be OK. That inspires me. Leaders must inspire. Well, Freeman, you, you, you're right. We all need inspiration, and, and I would say you've been one today. So I, I can't thank you enough for joining the show. Um, and for all of you listening, thank you for listening to Engaging Leaders, a Leadership Maryland podcast brought to you by Beacon at Salisbury University and BFG Financial Advisors. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you to stay engaged. Be sure to tune in for new content every month. You've been listening to Engaging Leaders, a Leadership Maryland podcast. Leadership Maryland is the foremost statewide organization where critical conversations occur in an environment of trust and civility to facilitate actionable change. For more information, visit us at www.engagingleaderspodcast.com. Please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform.